Thank you so much, everyone, for joining the webinar on the Welcome Data Prize for Mental Health. Um, looks like it's going to be a really interesting session. I'm really pleased to have so many great speakers with us today. Um, just to quickly introduce myself before talking a little bit about the agenda um, and passing over to colleagues at Welcome to talk about the data prize itself. Um, I'm Rosanna um, Hardwick from Social Finance and I'm leading on delivery of the data prize in the design phase um, as part of a team engaging with data holders and stakeholders, um, including those with lived experience and within our advisory group. Um, I'll apologise in advance for the last minute swap of who is chairing. My colleague Nick is unfortunately unwell and I've stepped into chair as of this morning. So please bear with us um, if things are, are slightly less smooth than otherwise. But I think with COVID, we're all adjusting things being a bit more unpredictable. So um, luckily, I'm also not the main event. So we've got plenty of, of speakers today to be sharing more about the data prize and some of the data sets that are really key to making this happen. Um, so I'll be chairing the webinar and trying to keep us to time and talking a little bit more about the timelines for the data prize itself to share a bit more inf information for those of you um, joining and, and new to the concept. Um, before we move on, just a very brief bit about Social Finance Welcomes Delivery Partner for the prize. Uh, we're a not-for-profit social impact organisation and work on a variety of topics where there are typically intersectional factors of marginalisation, access and inequalities. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of us before, we work across the public sector and government, um, so from areas like healthcare and employment to children's services and housing to further afield, um, and working on, for example, outcomes-focused development bonds around the world. Um, we'll be sharing a lot more about the data prize itself shortly, so I won't go into too much detail here um, before we run through the agenda. Um, but just to introduce that we're really excited, we've been working on um, the data prize collectively for a good few months now, planning out um, what this will look like. And whilst there are still a few months till uh, the formal launch, it's great to see the interest here on the webinar today and uh, have a chance to start talking with everyone and engaging about what this could look like and some of the impacts that we could have through projects that could come through the prize. Um, so without further ado, just to walk us through the agenda and what we've planned for today. Um, so I'll shortly be handing over to our colleagues at Welcome to give an introduction to the data prize and data prizes in general, as well as the embedded approach taken around active ingredients. Um, I'll let Kat talk to that more, but it's really at the core of the analysis our participants will be undertaking. Um, after that, we'll be taking a look at some of the tools and longitudinal data sets that really enable work like this. Um, so we'll be starting off with Rebecca of UCL, who will walk us through the resources at CLOSA, followed by Louise at King's College, who will walk through the catalogue of mental health measures. And then Lynn from Bristol, who will give us an overview of the ASVAC data set. Um, so really pleased to have everyone um, speaking today. And what we'll then do is have some time at the end for any questions that people might have for our presenters or on the data prize in general. Um, as a quick bit of housekeeping, we'll be recording the session just to make everyone aware. Um, so we'll share that out for those who were unable to make the webinar or if you enjoyed it so much that you want to watch it again. Um, we'll take questions throughout the session um, and we'll be answering in the chat bar. So please do raise questions as they come up in the chat bar, um, in which case we'll either flag to try and answer in the Q&A session that we'll have at the end, or we can try and answer straight away. Um, and feel free to, if, if you'd rather raise your questions at the end um, in person, then we'll make sure that we've got some time for that. Or indeed, if there are any questions that need a more in-depth answer, we can always take those away and, and follow up by email or another call. Um, so hopefully that covers a, a brief intro to what we're looking to cover today. As I said, there's, there's lots here. Um, so without any further ado, I'll hand over to Ekin um, to share a bit more about the prize. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us here today. Uh, so my name is Ekin Burukbashi, and I work as Data Challenges Manager for Data for Science and Help Team um, at Welcome. And um, I guess what I'm going to do just now over the couple of, next couple of minutes, just to set the scene a little bit about Welcome, what we are trying to achieve and what we are trying to do as data team at Welcome, uh, and also our principles for Welcome Data Prizes program before passing it over to my colleague uh, from our mental health team. So um, you may be aware that towards the end of last year, Welcome has launched its new strategy, which is to support science to solve the urgent health challenges facing everyone. 
So as part of this new vision, we'll support discovery research into health, life and well-being, and we'll also aim to solve three worldwide health challenges, which are mental health, climate and health, and infectious diseases. So as Data for Science and Health team, we have a cross-cutting function across discovery research and these three health challenge areas. And simply put, we want to see trustworthy data science transform how science solves health challenges and makes discoveries. And basically, my main task is to design and deliver a Welcome Data Prizes program, which is a new approach and a new adventure for us. So when we were thinking about Welcome Data Prizes program, uh, we kind of thought um, what was important to us and what we really, we really wanted to achieve um, in, in kind of delivering this new, uh, this new endeavor. And we decided on three main principles. So firstly, uh, we decided that we reach out uh, beyond our usual networks because we think that solving urgent health problems requires the right skills experience and different perspectives yet we know that most research on health happens within established research communities and disciplines and we really want to change that secondly we'll we'll put the participation and involvement at the heart of our approach our data prizes have been designed to make sure that participation and involvement are at the center of the projects that we fund. We value lived experience and partner with the communities we are working with throughout the data prize at different stages. And finally, we want to raise awareness around the health challenge and inspire solutions. We'll talk about our work openly, share learnings, success stories, and difficulties encountered throughout. We aim to increase public awareness of the health problem and give ideas about possible digital approaches to address it and inspire policy and decision makers. So with these principles in mind, we are now launching the first data prize uh, in partnership with our mental health team and social finance. And the question we want to answer here is what prevents, treats and helps to manage anxiety and depression in young people in the UK and South Africa. And I, uh, with this in mind, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Kat Sebastian from our mental health team to give us a little bit of more detailed insights uh, from the mental health uh, perspective. Thanks, Ekin. Um, so I'm Kat Sebastian. I'm the head of the evidence team for mental health at Wellcome. Um, and it's great to be here to tell you a bit more about our mental health strategy and how that links in with the uh, mental health data prize. Um, so as Ekin mentioned, uh, mental health is one of three health challenges um, that Welcome are challenging, uh, taking on over the coming years. Um, and we see mental health as a serious health challenge that is holding people back in all parts of the world and is set to become the largest burden of disease in the world by 2030. Um, and we view mental health as a tangle of biological, psychological and social factors um, that are intricately intertwined um, and we need to understand more about the processes that give rise to poor mental health and also those factors that can help those with mental health problems. Um, so we want to find and fund cutting edge mental health science um, and mental health is a very broad area. So in the first instance, we are focusing on anxiety, depression and psychosis in those under 30. Um, and in particular, our priorities are to understand um, how brain, body and environment interact in mental health problems, um, but also to understand how interventions are actually working. Um, and this is um, most relevant for the data prize, and I'll talk about our actual ingredients program of work on the next slide, but really understanding how interventions work so that we can better improve and personalize interventions to prevent, manage and solve mental health problems. Alongside these scientific goals, um, we also want to um, build what we're calling a mental health science community, bearing in mind that mental health is a very interdisciplinary issue, and we want to bring together researchers, clinicians, those with lived experience, um, people working in multiple disciplines across science that can be brought to bear on mental health. Alongside that, we want to agree some common ways of measuring mental health outcomes so that we can ensure that we're all talking about the same thing and measuring it in a standard way. And then ultimately, we want to share the insights that we gain from this research programme with policymakers and thought leaders so that this can support more effective uptake. Um, next slide, please. 
So this brings me to the Active Ingredients Programme program of work, which will be the focus for the Mental Health Data Prize. Um, and this is really based around the idea that although there is a range of treatments and prevention initiatives, there has been limited improvements in mental health outcomes over the past few decades. Um, and particularly when it comes to youth anxiety and depression, um, we don't have a good understanding of how treatments work um, and in particular how they vary across different contexts. So the question we've been asking over the last couple of years is what works for whom, in what contexts and why? And we've called this the Active Ingredients Programme of Work because what we've asked researchers to do is to focus in on specific aspects of an intervention that are driving clinical effects. So we're not just interested um, broadly in our antidepressants effective or is CBT effective, but we're interested in the specific aspects that are driving clinical effects are conceptually well-defined and link to specific hypothesized mechanisms of action for how they're actually working. Um, and over the last couple of years, we have funded over 50 research teams um, to conduct a review exercise for us so that we can understand the um, state of the science um, for 46 different active ingredients that have been argued by the researchers to help address youth anxiety and depression. And just to give a few examples of what we mean by active ingredients, um, these encompass a very broad range um, from cellular right up to the societal. So um, we had a team that looked at um, SSRI antidepressants and the mechanisms of action and their efficacy in young people. Um, we've had research teams who look at, have looked at circadian rhythms and the role of sleep interventions in mental health. Um, also more kind of societal ingredients such as um, urban design and how that leads to uh, differential access to green space and the effect that that might have on youth mental health. So um, as I mentioned earlier, our strategy is um, to see mental health problems as a sort of intricate tangle of biological, psychological and social factors. Um, and with the Mental Health Data Prize, um, we really want to learn more about what works for whom, in what context and why, for youth anxiety and depression. I think back to Rosanna. Thanks so much, Kat. Um, now, just moving on briefly, before we introduce our speakers, I just wanted to run us quickly through the timelines for the prize to share a bit more about the structure. Um, a reminder that you don't need to remember these off by heart. Um, we'll be sharing the recording and materials will be sent out in due course as well as we progress um, to the next stages of the prize. Um, for the purpose of visualising the roadmap and, and timeline of the data prize, we've split this into three main segments. Um, so we've got the design and launch of the prize, um, which is the inception phase that we're in now, where Welcome and Social Finance have worked to co-design the prize um, and curate our core data sets alongside our advisory group of multidisciplinary professionals and also our youth advisory network of young people with lived experience. Um, we've obviously begun to publicise the prize and, and talk about it more openly and engage with wider stakeholders. And that's with a view to in the new year beginning to support the creation of multidisciplinary teams where we'll aim to bring together groups um, where we have potential participant teams uh, that might feel like they have a skills gap. We'll also be looking at being able to join together teams in different areas of expertise um, so that we can have the right mix of different skills for participating teams. Um, following that, we're planning to launch formally in April of next year, um, where teams will be able to apply with their use case proposals. Um, so that will include the research question that a team is looking to answer, and also their approach to thinking about tool development during the length of the prize. So that means both looking at what are the insights that we might look to get from data analysis, and also what are tools that could potentially be useful for the research community. Following the launch, um, we'll be looking at selecting 10 teams um, around July of next year and providing them with seed funding of about £25,000 to begin their work. Um, from there, we move on to, to the next section, which is the data prize proper. Um, and that's where our 10 teams will be undertaking research on active ingredients and mental health and exploring what works for young people using the core data sets in the prize, as well as any data sets that participants want to bring to the, the analysis themselves. 
So participants will use this phase to also start ideating about tools that could facilitate, disseminate, or indeed help with doing research. And then the plan is after six months in January 2023, five teams will then be selected for further funding of £100,000 to continue any analysis and further prototype the tools or products developed alongside the research. So during both the initial and prototyping phase, um, the participating teams will receive structured support um, in the form, form of problem solving workshops, training and support from the team so that we can bring together these different skill sets to make sure that we can have the impact that we're looking to have um, through the prize. And then in September, at the end of the year, the winning teams will be selected through a demo day and judging panel, with the first prize being £200,000 and two runners up receiving £100,000. Um, and the winning teams will also then go into a sustainability phase, which then supports scaling of the tool and research outputs um, to be able to ensure that we can embed them as widely as possible. Um, so alongside the, uh, the, the timelines, we just wanted to quickly talk through as well the concept of core data sets and what that means in the context of the prize. So um, we won't talk through all of the data sets. Um, many of you are probably familiar with ones that might be relevant for the prize. And also I'm conscious of time and, and being able to pass on to our speakers. Um, but the idea is that participants will have access to a number of data sets containing cohort data from the UK and South Africa. Um, so this will include, for example, ALSPAT, Next Steps, Birth to 30. And the cohorts within the studies vary significantly, but we've looked at some of the key considerations um, around the data sets to work out which ones could be most impactful and useful for participants. Um, so the sort of things that we've looked at are active ingredients being present in the data, whether or not the data is longitudinal, including at least three waves so that there's enough richness to allow us to get insight from the data. Um, so these data sets are intended to provide a basis for analysis and research, and what we're looking at doing is streamlining the process um, so that participants can be able to access data as easily as possible. But as previously mentioned, participants can also bring their own data sets and begin to build um, the, the community of open data um, around the prize that can be used in future. Um, I'm sure the questions may be starting to form, um, so please do put them in the chat or hold them to the Q&A at the end, um, and then we can make sure to, to cover them then. Um, but following that brief introduction, I wanted to pass over to Rebecca to walk us through the, the closer data set. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Rosanna. I'm just going to try sharing oh, my screen. Oh, I can't do it at the moment. Hold on. Okay, so hopefully everybody can um, see my screen now. So thank you, Rosanna, and thank you um, for inviting me to give this talk and to be able to give an overview of some closer resources that might be useful. So I'm Rebecca Hardy, I'm at UCL, and I'm director um, of CLOSA. And CLOSA is a partnership um, which brings together 19 longitudinal studies. Um, and the aim is to maximize the use, value, and impact of these um, world-leading studies. And CLOSA is also very um, interdisciplinary. So it works across the social and the biomedical sciences to solve social and biomedical um, challenges. And our other partners are the British, British Library and the UK Data Service. So this slide just shows our now 19 partner studies. Until recently, we had um, nine, eight, sorry, eight partner studies. We now have 19 longitudinal studies based in the UK. And these include cohorts, birth cohorts, panel studies, and they're also from national, um, nationally representative um, samples and regional samples. And one of them is ALSPAC, which you'll hear about um, later. So with our analysis of a single longitudinal study can be extremely um, valuable and useful, CLOSER has particularly promoted um, an AIDS cross-study analysis. 
So as well as simply pooling data across studies um, to increase the power, as is commonly done in, for example, genetic studies, um, we can also select studies and compare across different groups, for example, across generations or across different geographies to see whether, for example, there are differences in the way a characteristic um, changes with age um, or whether um, associations um, between a risk factor and an outcome um, change with age. And there's just an example on this slide um, of some data um, from CLOSER where we've harmonized um, body size data and social class data and looked at social inequalities in BMI across generations, which is very informative in terms of analysis. So I mentioned harmonization, comparing studies, um, results across studies, we have to make sure that the differences are not due to methodological differences and discrepancies um, across the studies, and for example, the way the data are collected. So one aspect is to ensure that the variables are equivalent, and this requires data harmonization. Now, data harmonization can be done prospectively, where studies agree to collect the same data in the same way, um, or with longitudinal studies, because of their different histories and the need to balance the within study consistency with between study comparisons. Often this has to be done in retrospect. And this is what CLOSER um, has done. So as I say, there's an example on this slide. Um, and those, those data were produced from CLOSER harmonization work packages. Now, CLOSER has had um, 16 harmonization work packages over the years on a wide range of topics. Now, most of these are, have been completed or are now coming to the end. They cover a huge range of topics, for example, from incomes and earnings and education to DNA methylation. Now, half of these work packages, the ones that you'll see in um, bolded colors here, have produced harmonized data sets um, across um, multiple um, studies, which are then deposited at the UK data service. So the data sets are produced and they're accompanied by detailed user guides and syntax so that other users can then know exactly how they were derived. And you can therefore make decisions about whether to use them, whether they're um, relevant um, for your particular research project. The other work packages um, in white here, where harmonization was not possible, produce other resources such as reports to summarize the information available. Now, I just wanted to highlight, although all of these um, work packages might be useful for mental health research, there are three work packages that were specific to mental health measures. And you'll hear about one of these, um, the mental health and wellbeing measures usage. That was um, the development of the mental health catalog that you'll hear about from Louise in a minute. And the other harmonization packages were on mental health um, variables across birth cohorts in the UK, and another one on childhood um, well environment and adult well-being. Now, for all the work packages, this just illustrates the process that's been undertaken. Um, in the derivation um, and the harmonization process. So it goes from identification through to validation. Now, some of the work packages will stop before the derivation stage where it's not been possible to derive harmonized measures. And the ones where the data are deposited at the UKDS will go through the derivation and also a validation stage before they're deposited. But key to this is that there's clear documentation of the whole process and this is vital um, for the transparency and it allows other researchers to build on the work that's already done. So they don't have to start from the identification and evaluation of information across studies, even if you, you haven't managed to harmonize the variables. So I just wanted to give you an idea of the sort of um, resources from those two um, mental health um, work packages that I talked about. So this is work um, led by George Plebidis and Owen McElroy. And here um, are mental health um, variables, um, mental health harmonization and measurement properties resource um, report was produced, which is on the CLOSER website. And this details the work that was done on the measurement properties um, across the studies. So there was actually very little overlap in the scales used in mental health across these um, studies. And so there was a lot of measurement um, 
property work done and also looking down to the individual items. So there's also this tool, this interactive tool, which identified overlapping items from those scales, which again is available. And there will be data sets that are being prepared at the moment for deposit at the UK Data Service. Now, one of the data sets that is already deposited is for the Childhood Environment and Wellbeing Work Package led by Natasha Wood and my Stafford. Now, wellbeing in this case was prospectively harmonised with the WEM being used across all included studies, while a range of childhood variables um, was harmonised through recoding. Um, and there was consideration of the underlying um, constructs um, being similar in this work. So those are the harmonization resources. The other resources, or the other resource that I just wanted to highlight is our flagship product, Closer Discovery. Now Discovery is the UK's most detailed um, search engine for longitudinal data. And Closer Discovery is based on very detailed um, metadata. So metadata is data about the data. Discovery currently includes um, information on 10 of the closer partner studies, um, though not all um, data um, from all of those studies are currently available and it's been continually, the content is continually updated. Now I just wanted to clarify that the data, it's metadata within Discovery, the data is not included in Discovery, so you can't access data via Discovery, so you still would have to go through separate access procedures um, for the different studies. I also wanted to mention that it includes a lot of COVID um, sweep data as well now. That was a priority um, in the last year to get those um, metadata in. But what metadata is important for is guiding the use and the interpretation of the data and helps you decide whether a study has the particular information you require for your research. So we work with our partner studies um, to document their data in a consistent and standardised format and what the platform does is it offers um, details the full lineage of the data so that's to say that it provides detail about the original questions um, used to capture the data and then they're directly linked to the variables and you can also take a look at frequencies um, in um, discovery and in future the functionality of um, discovery is going to be enhanced so for example work's being carried out to develop um, a way of looking for equivalent variables, both within and across um, studies. And I just wanted to highlight um, the demonstration videos which are on um, the website, um, which um, illustrate the different ways in which you can search for variables and explore the data um, that's available. So finally, just to show you what discovery looks like and the link to where you can find it, you can see um, at the bottom of this slide, um, there are the studies um, that are included, that have the, um, included in um, Closer Discovery. And as I say, um, content updates are, you know, take place multiple times a year. So um, the content of discovery is continually um, being updated. So I finally just wanted to thank the team and particularly to Dara O'Neill, who's the harmonization lead and to John Johnson, who leads the discovery team and the funders, the um, ESRC. And I'll leave you with um, our contact details and the links to both um, discovery and to some of our other resources. So the other one that I wanted to just flag up um, was the um, Closer Learning Hub. Um, which provides training material um, for those new to longitudinal studies, including information on metadata and data harmonization. Thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Rebecca, for a really fascinating presentation. Um, as we said at the beginning, we'll be leaving time for a, a fuller Q&A at the end of the three, um, but please do drop questions in the chat and we'll either answer them now or hold them for that um, section. But without further ado, I'll pass on to Louise um, for our next presentation. Hi, can you just, uh, can someone confirm that you can see my slide properly? Yes, that's showing. 
Lovely, thank you. Thank you. So um, my name is um, Louise Arsenault and I am Professor of Developmental Psychology at King's College London. And I also am the Mental Health Leadership Fellow for the <clears throat> Economic and Social Research Council. And as part of that role, I developed a tool or a platform that we call the Catalogue of Mental Health Measures. And we're delighted that um, the Welcome Trust and Social Finance believe that that could be a useful tool for people who want to apply for the data prize. So in the next few minutes, I just want to take you through um, what the catalog can offer. And you can see uh, below that you have the uh, website address and you also have the QR. So if you want to access the catalog as I speak, you know, that could be good. Um, um, so that you have an idea of the catalogue itself. I, I'm just going to present you slides today, so I will not uh, access the catalogue itself. So basically, the catalogue compiles and organizes details on the full spectrum of mental health topics and related measures from longitudinal uh, ongoing studies. Together, these studies cover nine decades of data collection over 4,000 mental health measures from 427 data collection points. So we have a wealth uh, of um, mental health measures um, available. So the catalog features description of the studies as well as the instruments used to assess mental health and well being. It also includes fine grained details um, on each of the measures, such as the items, the informants, the response scales, and reporting periods. Um, and by providing these details, um, we think that the catalog um, can help to facilitate harmonization work and cross cohort um, research and also interdisciplinary work. So as Rebecca mentioned, we have been funded by CLOSA. And so we are some kind of um, um, maybe a, a smaller um, platform compared to discovery that you just heard about. So we kind of work with uh, a greater number of cohorts, but we are focused on, on mental health. Um, um, yes, so let me tell you, so I, I won't describe the whole process of building the catalog, but what I want to share with you um, is the process of selecting which studies could be part of the, of the catalog. So um, originally we only had one year of funding, so we had to really limit the scope of the catalog. Um, and we decided to include in the catalog only longitudinal studies. And it's not to say that other design, study design are not important, is that we had to limit ourselves to studies that have multiple sweeps of um, data collection that contain mental health measures, of course, that include at least 200 per participants at the first sweep to make sure that you would have enough participants through the years. Um, also have data collected as part of British context. So we do have some uh, European consortium included, um, but we include only the uh, British um, um, content of it. And the study had to be ongoing. And again, it's not to say that historical data are not interesting and important. It's just to make sure that if people are interested in using the data, there will be someone at the end of the line being able to um, derive a, um, a data set and being able to share the data. So in total, there are um, 51 studies um, that have been reviewed as part of the um, catalog. And these are all the studies. Um, I just want to mention that most of the studies are cohort studies, but you do have different cohorts. Um, you have different designs. You do have some um, panel surveys. You do have repeated cross-sectional surveys that are really important for um, the research on mental health. So we included them. You do have twin studies as well. And when it comes to cohort studies, um, some of them start early in life. We have two, I think, pregnancy studies, um, but then we do have several of them that starts in childhood and lots of them that starts as well in the later years. So we have kind of aging cohorts that seems to be um, um, very rich um, at the moment. 
The studies cover um, the four nations. So uh, some of them are nationwide and some of them are much more regional. Um, and altogether, they kind of um, provide um, lots of information about mental health across the population um, in the UK. Um, there you go. Um, so let me go into a little bit more detail about how to use the catalog and what it can provide. So basically, the catalog can provide a platform, a search engine for um, providing details about mental health measures. And you can do a search either on mental health topic, on a specific study or a specific instrument. And when you kind of make a search, you would kind of um, press the, the keyword, your, type the keyword in this um, little box here. And then you can see that you have a timeline um, and uh, we've changed actually, we don't have trees anymore, which is a shame because I think that pine trees would be appropriate for um, this time of the season, but we recently changed it to uh, sprouts. So you'll have a different design now. And those little kind of, um, trees or sprouts, they do indicate that we do have, there are some measures of depression that are collected in different time point as part of that um, study. So we do provide information here about when the data was collected, how old were the participants. But the important section here is really below where we provide information about what scale was used by clicking on one point, what scale was um, used, the focus, so whether it was the participants, whether it was the parents, their sibling, or their relatives. So the catalog consider only the study participants and people above, siblings, parents, grandparents, uncles, and aunties, but we don't review the mental health measures collected on their children yet. Um, we also um, list who was the informant and whether there was a standard instrument that was used or whether it was um, a non-standard um, instrument. When you click on the um, instrument itself, what you will see will be detail about which item have been used and what is the um, response scales. So we do that because um, there's great variety in instruments that were used, whether they are standard or non-standard, and sometimes using or knowing the items themselves can be um, more important or informative for harmonization work. We also provide uh, information about the study itself. So um, we provide the aim of the overall um, study, where it's based, the geographical coverage, um, when it started, the year that it started. And we also kind of provide information about the sample. So just using the catalog, you can have great information about the studies and about the um, mental health measures um, as well. The last bit of information is also really, really important. So we do provide um, data access and a little bit and similarly to discovery, we don't provide um, data. We leave that to the study themselves. But what we do is to provide information about how to access the data. And I think in the context of the data prize, it's really important that people before they search or they kind of um, move forward with their ideas, really kind of consult um, the access to the data. So there's lots of um, different ways that studies do share the data. It could be as as easy as downloading the data set that are um, maintained quite often with UK Data Service, an amazing, amazing kind of service. But sometimes studies have different ways. So sometimes you have to submit a project which will get reviewed. Um, some of them you have to pay. So I think um, it is a good place to start just to see um, what is the regulation for accessing the data. We also kind of provide information as to whether genetic data have been collected and whether linkage to administrative data um, have been collected and we provide which one. There are much more there. In the case of this study, these are the two types of data that were collected. You have access to the website, and then we provide as well a list of um, related themes that could be relevant for um, the research. You have a profile cohort paper as well here, and then we provide details about the funders, which could be um, interesting and um, relevant.
To narrow down the search, um, we provide different tools. So think about depression, for example. If you kind of click in depression, most likely you will get you will get 50 studies, um, you know, or close to 50 studies. So if you want to narrow down your search, then you can use different filters. Um, and one which is really important is the related measures. So for these measures here, we don't provide um, detailed information as we do for the mental health measures, um, but it is indicating which study have rich data on those different um, measures. So for example, if you're interested in looking into depression, you may be interested in looking into diet and nutrition or neighborhood, for example, or personalities. And that will narrow down your search. You also have different filters, which could be in terms of complementary data, the study design, um, the sample characteristics, the age at recruitment, the sample size, the geographic uh, coverage, or the start of, um, uh, of the study, the start date of the study. So these are kind of different filters to help you um, identify which studies could be um, useful for your um, project. Another way of using the catalog is to say, I want to work with ALSPAC, for example, but I want to know which measure they are, are included in ALSPAC. ALSPAC is rich, rich of mental health data. You can use the catalog and then you can see which measure of depression were collected at what time, by who, and all that kind of information. In terms of mental health and well-being topics, so we look on not only at mental health problems, but we also look at the positive side of mental health. We do include indicators of mental health problems, measures of psychological well-being, um, and here we kind of include um, um, quality of life, um, life satisfaction um, as indicator of well-being. We also include impairment or difficulties resulting from mental health problems, and we also include treatment, service use, and help-seeking um, measures. So we're not only uh, focusing on diagnosis or disorders, um, but we take a broad, broad approach to mental health um, and well-being. And these are the type of um, topic, mental health topic that are covered um, by the catalog. Um, and then you have, um, you know, the list kind of go on. And this list probably needs to be updated because um, as we review more and more studies, there are more and more different topics that uh, comes out. There's one which is misophonia, I think, which ALSPAC has. Um, and we like we like to kind of really highlight unique features of each of the studies. So that is a good one, misophonia and ALSPAC. I want to highlight as well that the catalog has a section on COVID studies. So um, during and after COVID, lots of research increased their data collection to be able to study the impact of the pandemic on mental health problems. So we have a section which kind of focus on this um, on this kind of effort from longitudinal cohorts to be able to address that. Important to mention that we do not cover any new cohort studies that were implemented to address COVID. These are, um, we cover the mental health or the COVID assessment as part of existing cohort studies. So these studies would have most of the time, pre-COVID and post-COVID um, assessment. And then you have, um, you can list, the timeline is uh, more specific because there was a very intense um, effort to be able to address that. We constantly update the catalog. Um, if there is something missing, please get in touch with us. I just want to add that in January, we're gonna add physical health data as part of the catalog. For the physical health data, once again, we will not go into um, detail, depth, de uh, specific details about the measures, but for each time point, there will be a list of physical health measures that were also assessed uh, in parallel to the mental health topic that you're looking at. Um, so that will be an addition, which should be January or February, I think. Um, and then genetic uh, summary tables will come in a little bit later um, as well. 
Um, and I forgot my slide to acknowledge the, the work of all the team that works with me on the catalog and importantly acknowledge Closer, who were the first um, to really kind of support our idea and um, uh, give us funding. Maybe finishing in mentioning that the catalog is part of Datamine, which is this new MRC funded uh, mental health data hub, which is housed by HDR UK Health Data Research um, UK. So as part of Datamine, you can find uh, more information about different types of data, not just longitudinal data, but the catalog is the platform focusing specifically on longitudinal um, data. I hope that that's helpful. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Louise. A, a huge amount of food for thought. And um, as I said before, please do drop questions in the chat and we'll either pick them up now or shortly. But again, um, without taking up too much time, I want to hand over to Lynn for the third of our presentations. Ooh, sorry. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll just share my screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Can you see my screen? Can anyone see the screen? Yeah, that's good. It's not in presentation mode yet, if you're able to swap over, but that's showing fine. Okay. Is it in presentation mode now? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Hi everyone, um, I'm so pleased that you asked us to come along and present on the ALSPAC data set. We're very excited about this project and really, really keen to be involved in it. So um, I'm Lynn Malloy, I'm the Chief Operating Officer in ALSPAC, which is also known as Children of the 90s. So what I'm going to do today is just give you a brief description of ALSPAC and then touch on the mental health data that we've got in ALSPAC as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first of all, just kind of to give you the context. So ALSPAC, known as Children of the 90s, is a birth cohort which is based in Bristol in the UK. And we recruited 14 and a half thousand pregnant women uh, between 1991 and 1992. And in a nutshell, um, we spent the last 30 years collecting data and samples on the original children, their mothers and fathers. And for the last few years, we've also extended recruitment out to the children of the children now. And that's becoming an increasingly important part of the study. So ALSPAC is primarily a biomedical study. We consider the face-to-face -face data and sample collection that we do um, our gold standard, but we collect data in other ways as well. We have two co cohort profiles, and if you're interested in finding out more, then um, please do look at these two cohort profiles. There's a lot more detail in there. So ALSPAC is a multi-generational study. So um, the three boxes here highlighted in red are the three generations that we have by far the most data on. Um, so we have the ALSPAC G1. These are the original children. So just over 14,000. Their mothers, um, G0. The fathers as well. We have some data on the um, G0 fathers too. And then the um, G2, the children of the children that I mentioned just now, and we have um, just over 1500 children recruited into that part of the study at the moment. So apologies, this is a really busy slide. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but I just kind of wanted to give you the um, kind of key aspects of the study, if you like. So ALSPAC, we have around 30,000 participants that we're regularly in contact with. We have lots of biosamples collected over the years, so 1.2 million collected and stored in our freezers, and we have over 90,000 variables collected um, over the years too. So 30 years of a deep um, longitudinal study and really kind of focusing in on um, and collecting very rich data, as, as Louise mentioned earlier on, kind of collecting very rich data on these um, generations of the cohort. So we collect data in four main ways. So we do self-completion questionnaires, face-to-face clinic assessments, 
We also um, collect linkage data, so um, linked to external records, and we collect biological samples and do genetic uh, research as well. So in terms of self-completed questionnaires, so with the original mothers, so the G0 um, original mothers, we um, did recruit, recruit during pregnancy. That was a very important time for us in the study. And the mothers received four questionnaires to complete during their pregnancy. And from then on, we've asked them to do annual questionnaires so over the last 30 years. Their partners, um, so we relied on the G0 mothers to pass on um, details to their partners. Um, and we have two questionnaires that we collected during pregnancy on the study fathers and again annually thereafter. And then on the children, um, so we started asking them to complete very simple questionnaires from around the age of five. And then they've um, substantially got more detailed over time, um, as, as you can imagine. And now they are kind of full, full questionnaires that they receive because they're aged around 30 now. And we think we have um, well over 100,000 questions that have been answered between them, so lot, lots of data there. So face-to-face -face clinical assessment. So for the first seven years of the study, we had a group that we called Children in Focus, which was around 2000 um, of our children, where we collected um, a great deal of data and uh, biological samples from this group. And from the age of seven onwards, we widened out to the whole of the cohort. <laughs> And we've taken um, physical measures over that time. So as you can see there, that ranges from, you know, blood pressure, lung function, allergy testing, vision, hearing, et cetera. We've also collected cognitive measures. So memory, speech and IQ, environmental measures, diet, um, pollution, for example, and also lots and lots of blood samples um, over, over the years as well. So this is just a picture of some of those. So that ranges from lung function through to DEXA scanning through to eye testing. So a whole series of different measures that we've undertaken. We've also um, collected data on the original mothers in their own right, if you like. So we focused on um, four clinical assessments on the mothers that we called focus on mothers clinics. So the first focus in mother clinic was um, a, from 2008 to 11, where they were aged um, 48, around 48. And then um, the last one was in 2014-15, when they were aged around 53. With the dads, we have also collected data and biological samples on the fathers, although um, less data. Uh, we did one focus on fathers clinic between 2011 and 2013 when they were aged um, around 53. Two, 2000 fathers attended that clinic and a further um, 800 provided questionnaire data. We also link to external records and we're constantly reviewing this and trying to link to new records where we can. So we have um, records, um, education, health, criminal earnings and benefits um, records that we link to routinely as well. So biological samples I mentioned, we have lots of them. We have blood, urine, um, umbilical cords and placentas. And we've got over 1.5 million samples um, that we store in our freezers in our basement of the clinic. And G2, so this is the children of the children's study, which is becoming um, a really important part of what we do. So this started in 2012, and we have just over 1,500 children in the study at the moment, and we're expected to increase that to 3,000 by 2024. Just a quick word on COVID. Like other um, longitudinal cohort studies, we've been exceptionally busy over COVID. We've tried to keep 
uh, sort of routine data collection going. Um, so we did virtual visits, for example, during um, the first year of the pandemic. But we've also collected a whole bunch of um, new data and samples on COVID as well. So, for example, we've done five questionnaires and a couple of um, antibody uh, tests, ho home antibody tests as well, plus a whole load of other um, studies that we've done too. So in terms of mental health data collection, Louise mentioned that we do have a lot of um, mental health data in, um, in ALSPAC. The easiest way to check out what we've got is to go onto the um, catalogue of mental health measures actually, um, although you're very welcome to look on our website as well. So we have lots of measures on our original children and offspring throughout their lives um, using validated scales, including all these different mental health measures that um, we've listed there. Misophonia isn't on there at the moment, but it is fascinating and um, we would love people to um, access that data. And as I've mentioned, we um, have repeat data collections throughout the COVID pandemic. So we've asked about depression, anxiety and well-being five times between April 20 and October 21. So that's the end of my presentation. Really happy to answer any questions on ALSPAC. Um, and also, please feel free to email me for anything um, specific as well. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lynn, for, for sharing more about our spec. Really fascinating. Um, as we shared before, we wanted to leave a bit of time at the end for any questions. Um, so we've got five or 10 minutes if anyone has questions either on any of the individual presentations and the particular data sets, or indeed going back to the start on the, the data prize structure and um, how it works. So please do feel free to put in the chat um, and we can respond um, or indeed on the question and answer function and we'd be happy to pick up. I'm conscious. Ah, uh, great. So one from Claire here about is the data prize application process limited to academic institutions? Um, Tara, I don't know whether you're yeah, happy, to that. happy to take that one. Um, so short answer is, is no. We're really looking um, for a wide range of participants um, from a, across different um, parts of the mental health community. However, um, because the focus is on longitudinal data sets, um, and you know, academic data sets, um, we expect it to be teams to be really multidisciplinary and mixed. Um, so including research expertise within the team. Um, another um, area that we're we're really focused on in this prize is that we're, we're really looking for lived experience to be included in the teams as well. Um, so it's really an exercise in forming new partnerships and, and facilitating new partnerships to form around, around youth mental health. Brilliant. Thanks, Taro. Um, any other questions, as I say, either about the data prize? Yeah, sorry, I saw Claire's question. Yeah, there's a follow up. Um, I think, um, yes, pretty much. I think, um, I think it would be good to have some research expertise within the teams, um, not necessarily saying you have to be have a university involved in every team. Um, but yeah, definitely demonstrating um, that the team's ability to conduct the research. Um, we've got a question from Jeff. Interesting question. So um, we focused a lot on um, psychological and biomedical factors, any data on spiritual dimension involvement. Um, that is a good question that's come up before. I think we are being very open about the dimensions that um, we look at. So not just looking at clinical um, uh, depression and anxiety. I know Kat's put her hand up, so she'll be able to speak to this as well. Um, we're actively looking for a wider range of data sets at the moment um, that look at, at wider factors. Um, but I'll pass on to Kat because she's probably better placed to answer this than me. Just to add um, that, yes, that would definitely be in scope if the data is available. One of our 46 active ingredients is indeed spirituality and religion. 
um, and that does come up a lot. Um, so yes, very interested to hear of any data sets that can address that. Brilliant. Um, we've got a question around the team matching process and how people will be able to meet each other. Um, we're currently, it's a hot topic, we're currently looking for a platform where um, uh, that we can use to help facilitate the matchmaking process. Um, we haven't picked one yet, um, but in the new year, hopefully we'll be launching that. So a space really where people, individuals, as well as like already half formed teams can kind of create profiles um, and uh, connect with others who might be interested in similar research questions. Um, so yeah, short answer is uh, yes, we, we, we intend to do that and it's, it's under development, hopefully to be launched next year. Brilliant, thanks Taro. And I would add to that, if anyone has any questions or thoughts on what would be helpful in terms of, for example, the match making process, really happy to receive um, input as we're continuing to finesse that process um, and think about what would be helpful. So please do reach out if, um, if anything else on that. Um, just double checking whether any other final questions before we wrap up, um, as I said, either for us in terms of the uh, the main prize or for any of the presenters. Whilst we wait for that, what we'll um, also do is share, we'll share a central email address that people can get in touch with um, on the chat, just in case anyone wants to follow up with any specific questions or feedback or thoughts as we continue to evolve the process and look towards launch in the new year. Um, what we also wanted to do is um, share that in terms of keeping in touch with developments for the prize, um, we are looking at curating a mailing list and being able to send out updates to people who are interested in finding out more. Um, so you can sign up to our mailing list. I think Romana um, has shared the link in the chat. Um, and that's where we'll be sending out updates as we continue to progress. So if we have further webinars, also as we're looking towards proposals launching and share more information about the, uh, for example, eligibility criteria evaluation and lots more to come um, in the new year. So please do sign up there and that will be the, the main avenue for us to share information. Obviously, we'll continue to put stuff on um, respective websites and social media as well. Um, but with that, I think, um, unless any final questions, um, a huge thank you to everyone for joining and also a massive thank you to our three speakers, Rebecca, Louise and Lynn, really appreciate your expertise and, and sharing everything and we're really excited to continue conversations. Um, so as everyone was sharing, the next phase of the prize will continue reaching out, having engagement, thinking about how we can support building out teams to apply to the prize. So hopefully the first of many more conversations, but as I say, really grateful for everyone joining um, and we'll be sharing the recording um, and lots more information in due course. But with that, we'll say thank you and um, have a great rest of day everyone.